to help people um, to attempt to, to develop or reposition their own brand. So um, that's, that's something else that you'll get uh, out of today's session. So I will share my screen. Okay, can you see that okay, Steve? I can. Yeah, Catherine, <laughs> already lost Steve. That's fine. Okay, so when Catherine and I were sort of um, discussing how to position today's presentation, um, we decided to call it a toolkit because that's exactly what it is. It's not, um, it's not a fancy strategic um, high level uh, discussion about sort of brand marketing. This is a practical hands-on session where we'll talk you through some of the tools that Catherine and I use to develop and reposition brands for our clients. Um, and we will literally, you know, we will leave you with uh, free templates that you can use uh, to do some work yourselves to organize your own um, thinking about brands. But I guess the place that I want to start is perhaps with the obvious question, which is what is a brand? Um, so these are brands, right? Well, not quite. Um, I think it's a common misconception that a brand, particularly amongst non-marketeers, um, that a brand is the, you know, the, the brand name, the logo, the typeface, the the color palette, the, the graphic assets, if you like. Um, and that's not really, that's not it at all. That's not a brand, um, that's a brand identity. Um, and I think we're gonna sort of develop this theme as we go along, but really you need to um, develop your thinking about what, what your brand is, what it actually is. And I think with these three, let's take these three as good examples, all big, um, big companies, big brands, um, we get a better clue of what the brand is if we start to dive into um, a bit about them. So look at Amazon, for example, um, a, a real godsend over the last 12 months. Um, Amazon's mission statement is to be Earth's most customer centric company. Our mission is to continually raise the bar of customer experience by using the internet and technology to help consumers find, discover and buy anything and empower businesses and content creators to maximize their success. Okay, so a couple of interesting things there. Um, some quite neat original wording to be Earth's most customer centric company not the world's most, to be Earth's most customer-centric company. So they've used some sort of articulate original positioning in that mission statement. The other interesting thing about the Amazon mission statement is it identifies the two audiences, it identifies the two audiences that they serve. Uh, they want to help consumers find, discover and buy anything, but they also want to empower businesses and content creators to maximize their success. So Amazon Marketplace is a key part of the Amazon proposition. So that takes a bit closer to what, what Amazon is all about. This is not Dove's mission statement. This is actually their part of their real beauty pledge. Dove wants to help make a positive experience of beauty accessible to all women. We believe that every woman should be able to define and enjoy beauty on her own terms, enjoying it as a source of pleasure and self-expression. So Dove, as a brand, stands for body confidence and helping women, helping women of, of all ages, shapes and sizes to be more positive and to be more confident about themselves. Then Tesco was well, a, <clears throat> a clue in the, the strap line, if you like, every little helps. But internally, um, they're their brand positioning is to serve shoppers a little better every day. Our business was built with a simple mission to be the champion for customers, helping them to enjoy a better quality of life and an easier way of living. Customers want great products at great value, which they can buy easily. So choice, value and convenience. Um, and that is this is possibly the most famous case study, 
most famous brand positioning case study, certainly in the UK, of the last 25 years. Every little helps. Uh, first emerged, I think, maybe 1995, something like that. And it's helped Tesco to become dominant um, in a fiercely competitive marketplace. So that helps you to understand what these brands are. Um, and I think that takes us closer to actually what a brand is. So um, a, a great retail guru called Martin Butler that I've had the privilege of working with before, I think some the well, certainly from retailers perspective um, in his book, people don't buy what you sell, they buy what you stand for. So our job as marketeers is to work out what we stand for. Uh, and the, the um, international conference speaker, TED Talks um, guru and sort of author of three or four books, Simon Sinek, makes the same kind of point, but looking wider than retail. He says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So that's a clue, I think, a strong clue as to what a brand is. So I think in, in our view, in mine and Catherine's view, and I think uh, generally, your brand is the sum of all the perceptions, positive and negative, of your customers or clients, if you're in B2B, past and present customers and future customers, your prospects, if you like. Um, and what that means is that your brand health, your brand reputation, your future success is going to depend on all the perceptions that your customers and prospects have gathered from every touch point you have with them. And obviously, some touch points matter a lot more than others. Store interactions, website experiences, phone calls, customer service touch points, product usage, delivery experiences, the opinions of friends and family, all of those things uh, accumulate uh, in the consumer's mind, in our minds, to form an overall perception of, of a brand, positive or negative. What, what a member of your family thought about it, the last delivery experience you had from an e-commerce brand. All those factors accumulate to create a brand. So that means for us as marketeers, we've got to achieve consistency of message across every touch point. Um, this is interesting, a minor sort of diversion. YouGov literally two or three weeks ago released their latest table of the best UK brands for 2020. And it's quite interesting because the top 10 are very familiar, almost exclusively very familiar very long established summer, 150 year old brands like John Lewis, Marks and Spencer, Cadbury, um, Boots, Royal Mail. Um, one or two surprises at Netflix um, after a pandemic lockdown year where sort of TV and entertainment has become much more important to us. Um, Netflix has uh, improved and jumped into the top 10, uh, according to YouGov. Um, the other interesting one was Cathedral City for me um, because uh, it's quite interesting to see a cheese brand in the top 10. But when I sort of talked to Catherine about this, um, she pointed out to me that actually, apparently, Cathedral City is in 50% of the UK's fridges. And that's amazing. So no wonder they're a, a well-trusted brand. The bit that I thought, sorry? In our fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yes, cheese. We love cheese, don't we, Catherine? <laughs> <laughs> it's in my fridge as well. Um, I went and looked after you mentioned it. What was interesting for me about this was what, how these, how this is calculated. So, um, YouGov calculate an index score, the YouGov brand index, and it's a measure of overall brand health. Uh, calculated by taking the average scores for impression, which is about reach, advertising, reach, uh, awareness, brand awareness, and so on. Customers' perception of quality and value, customer satisfaction, the likelihood that a customer will recommend a brand, and the company reputation. So those things combine in YouGov's brand index uh, to give a ranking of the, U of the UK's best brands. So I think that we definitely want to dive into that a little more um, in, in the next 
half an hour or so. So I think what we've established is that uh, if we want to develop a strong brand positioning, that means we've got to achieve a consistent brand message. So your brand has to be clearly positioned. It has to be well articulated. Earth's most customer centric company. Um, it has to be understood by every colleague, every employee that interacts with customers and prospects, because every one of those touch points um, adds to or detracts from um, your brand perception. And that means store staff, the web team, search marketers, email managers, social media channels, they all have to be singing from the same hymn sheet. Well, that's quite a challenge for us as marketeers. But the payoff is big when all your touch points with your customers and prospects reflect and echo a consistent message. And that is what you stand for. Then your brand begins to grow to benefit from a synergy that can grow your brand reputation and influence your future success. And that's really what Catherine, I want to talk to you about today, some ways that you can establish exactly what you stand for and how you can uh, make the most of it, how you can benefit from it. So let, let's dive into the Brand Marketers Toolkit. Okay, first of all, I'm going to touch on one or two other models that we've come across before um, that, that uh, could be very useful for you. And then, we're gonna, then Catherine is going to deep dive into the one tool that we find consistently uh, the most useful in terms of repositioning or positioning a brand um, and we're going to leave you with templates for for doing that so here's here's one the brand temple and this is one that i th think i first came across uh when we worked on argus which has got to be more than 10 years ago maybe 15 years ago i'd not come across the brand temple before it's also sometimes described as the brand pyramid, but essentially um, you establish the foundations of your temple. You know, what, what do you sell and what is it that makes you genuinely different? Then you have a number of pillars to your temple. I'm pretty sure that with Argus, it was about choice and quality and value and convenience and so on. Then you apply the roof, you know, what you offer as a brand that serves a higher purpose. This is the what you stand for, really, I think. How's your brand going to change people's lives for the better? Uh, and then you literally pinnacle that uh, with one word, what's described in the brand temple as one word e equity. What's the single word that you most want to be known for, that you most want your customers to, to think of, you know, the, um, what, when, when answering the question in a, a research survey? And then at the bottom, you can add the finishing touches. There's a link there if you want to go and find out more about it. That's one that we come across and indeed, I think we've used before. Um, this is one that I've only recently come across, but I think it looks really useful because it reflects some ways that, that, that uh, we've done things in the past. So this is called the Brand Value cam Canvas. Again, there's a link to it, um, but essentially it takes your products and services on one side, and it takes the customer jobs on the other side, and then it looks at where you can connect those. And customer jobs, you know, what are the what are the pains? What are the obstacles that the customer um, sort of has to tackle in in performing this task or finding a product for this task? And what are the things that um, what are the gains that the customer make can make from using your product for this task? Um, so body confidence, for example, in, in the case of Dove or or saving money um, or feeling better about themselves. And then you position your products and services as um, where are the things within your products and services that are pain relievers? What will help them overcome the obstacles that they face in achieving this objective? Um, and what are the things that will uh, help them to, you know, gain creators, as they're called in the brand value camp. One of the things that will help them to save money, to be more confident, whatever it is, to get where they're going quicker. Um, and then you turn them into what is effectively a, a kind of version of a, 
a Boston Consulting Group matrix, a matrix that helps you identify where you need to improve uh, aspects of your product and service communication, where your core messages are, where the opportunities lie. The interesting thing about that one is it reminded me of something that we also do was the pains and gains. I think that's an interesting aspect of the brand value canvas because we've also developed our own model for sort of internal purposes in the past. So the last one that I'm going to show you before I hand you over to Catherine for our, our go to brand development model. This one we call the proposition development matrix and essentially um, you start by creating sort of the elevator pitch in sort of plain, simple language. What is it that you're about? What do you offer? So I'll show you an example. Um, this is from a, a subprime secured lender that we, uh, we worked on for a number of years called Central Capital. <clears throat> and what Central Capital offered in, in a nutshell uh, was fast, easy access to loans from 3,000 to 75,000 for any reasonable purpose to homeowners because it was secured. And the place to start with this, what makes this really powerful is you start for, with the reasons why um, custom prospects won't respond to you, your marketing campaign. Why won't they? Why might they not respond to this marketing campaign for Central Capital? Well, in Central Capital's case, they can't afford another loan. They don't feel confident that they can manage their finances. They're concerned that it's secured against their house and so on. And then we look at, well, how can we overcome that? Can't afford another loan. Um, there's a benefit from consolidating your loans. It's secured against my house. We can make secured uh, a real benefit. But that then helps you to develop potential propositions. We've used this for campaign testing, but you could also use it for uh, brand positioning purposes. So they might not respond to your campaign because they can't afford another loan. Maybe we can overcome that with the consolidation benefit. By consolidating your debts, you could halve your monthly payments, more money in your pocket every month, and so on. And you can see how the proposition development matrix can help you to um, constructively think about uh, how you position yourselves to the customer and develop ways of overcoming the obstacles to the sale. And that's really what that's what all these models have in common. They help you to organize your thinking so you can work sort of constructively and creatively on on a brand positioning. So let me uh, introduce you to Catherine, uh, who's going to talk about our go to favorite model um, for organizing your thinking and sort of creatively developing a brand positioning. Thank you, Adrian. I'm going to, I need to escape, of course. I need to stop sharing so that you can share. Um, yes, yeah, so as Adrian mentioned, the brand key is a tool that we've used multiple times when we've been looking at rebranding or refreshing creative or just looking at new angles for brands. Um, I think sometimes thinking of a new angle for a brand can feel like finding a needle in a haystack because if you know and hopefully love your brand, there's lots of benefits about it. Um, so this really is a step-by-step -step tool which helps you reach that goal. So in terms of defining the brand, just press enter. Sorry, it's not going down for some reason. Hmm. Sorry, I don't understand why it's not. Uh, there it is. Sorry, <laughs> minor glitch. Um, so <laughs> I don't know why it's not clicking through. In terms of defining it, in simple tools, it's a step-by-step -step tool that helps you define what your brand stands for. So what's the leading message and how do you want your brand to be perceived? And it's also the framework behind your brand. So what's the substantiation? What's the proof behind what you're saying your brand stands for? And then it's also everything that follows on from that. So once you have 
kind of the essence of your brand, everything that follows on from that gives you a really a clear and cohesive message across every communication going forward. So in terms of using it, well, there's various places you can use it, but essentially we use it as a starting point of any brand building exercise, whether you're launching a new brand or reshaping an existing brand. Um, but it can also be for individual campaigns or launching a new product range. So you might find that you're not always gonna be doing a whole big rebrand of your brand because that doesn't happen very often, but you might have seasonal campaigns or you might, for example, be launching a premium product and you want an angle on that. Um, and essentially it's used to inspire roots. Um, so in a creative briefing or just to drive brand development discussions with your colleagues and agencies. So this is the brand key. Um, so as you can see, it looks like an old fashioned key or a keyhole. There's a number of sections, um, which I'll take you through step by step. And as Adrian mentioned, we'll leave a template. So you don't need to worry about um, noting everything down at the minute, um, but we find it best to work from the bottom and then go upwards. So splitting it into sections, the bottom section, which is the competitive environment and the target audience. I really think of that as setting the scene. And then we move upwards into the insight. Now the insight is probably the most important section, um, which is really about the customer's need. So do they have a problem or we like to think of it as what's the challenge. And then following on from that, as we're working around the circle, these sections are really about how your brand plays a part in answering that insight. So we're looking at the values and personality, the reasons to believe, the benefits, and your discriminators, your USPs. And finally, and hopefully, that leads you to unlocking your answer. So it gives you the essence. So I'm just gonna take you through each section. Um, starting at the bottom, we've got the target audience. Um, this section is pretty straightforward because um, hopefully you'll know your audience quite well. Um, and it's defined as the situation for which the brand is the best choice defined in terms of their attitudes and values in addition to demographics. But to simplify that, it's essentially your customer. Some key tips for when you're filling in that section, um, try and narrow it down. So be as specific as you can be about your audience. So you can say things like, for example, that they're C2DE and they're age 35 to 55, but you can also add in a bit of human touch. So it might be something like, after a difficult year, they're looking for ways to save money and their family comes first. So you're really painting a picture of who they are. Then in our next section, so it's the competitive environment. So this is defined as the market and alternative choices as seen by the consumer, the relative value the brand offers the market. So essentially the competition. Here it's helpful to obviously think of any examples of competitor brands, but also use any competitor knowledge that you have. So for example, you might wanna say something like, due to lockdown, more people are buying from larger Amazon, from larger online giants such as Amazon. Then moving upwards to our insight. So this is defined as the element of all you know about the target customers and their needs in the competitive environment upon which the brand is founded. So essentially, I like to think of this as the challenge. So here, imagine you're in your customer's head and what is it that they're after? Do they have a problem that we can fix? A good thing to think about here is that you can explore as many insights as you like. So you're doing one per brand key, but you can then go on to do as many brand keys as you like. So you don't need to worry at this point that your insight is too narrow or if I'm talking about um, a customer feels like they can't afford to shop at the minute, then I'm not thinking about what about the fashion choices or something like that. So you can explore as many insights as you like. This is really about exploring. Um, and using various insights helps you develop specific angles. So for the purposes of this exercise, I've just got a generic fashion brand in mind. Um, so an example might be for your insight, a customer could be thinking, I love looking good, but I don't really have the money for it at the moment. When I buy online, I don't know if it's gonna look good on me. So I'd rather just wish I could shop, um, buy in the shops. So another thing that helps here is if you have any real customer research. Um, so we found with um, a lot of our brand keys that using actual quotes from customers or 
things that we found that they've been saying in reviews or even on social media or from panels has really helped because we know that these insights are based on actual truths. Then moving up to the circular section. So this is where I mentioned, this is about how the brand play, plays a part. Um, the first section will be the benefits. So this is defined as the differentiating functional and emotional benefits that motivate the purchase. So essentially the advantages. Um, some tips for filling this in is just really thinking what are the benefits of my brand? But a key thing to do here is think back to your insight. So if we're thinking back to the insights of our fashion brand, it might be that they feel like they can't shop at the minute, but that's okay because we offer a great value or you can spread the cost um, or we have easy shopping and returns. So you don't need to worry if you don't think it's gonna fit if you buy it online. Um, we have a great range. So we offer clothes for petite plus size, tall ranges. Um, and also we offer great style advice. So it's kind of linking back to that insight. Then moving up to the values and personality. So this is essentially the brand persona. Um, what we do here is kind of think, what does your brand stand for? What is the personality of your brand? Or if your brand was a person, how would you describe them? So for example, you might say it's down to earth, uh, we're knowledgeable, or our fashion is made for real life and not the catwalk. We often get those from, um, we're often given those by the, from the client aren't we they're, they're the set yeah. of values that that already define them so those are often a given for us yeah and that makes it a lot easier so a lot of things around this circle of how your brand plays a part is hopefully things that you know inherently already yeah. um but then you can start linking them back to that insight so that's immediately starting to give you how my brand is gonna have that solution for them um so then in this section, we have the reasons to believe. So if we're saying we can do certain things, what's the evidence to substantiate that positioning? What's the proof? Um, some tips here is we think about how we can substantiate our benefits and values. So what I do is I just think because. So if I'm saying it's great value, then it's great value because, and then I think of my answer. So an example might be we're knowledgeable because we have a team of experts or we've been in the business for 50 years, or we're trustworthy because we have a five-star rating, or we offer great value because we have affordable prices and you can spread the cost with our personal account. And then finally, I we tend to leave this one last because it's the single most compelling and competitive statement the target consumer would like to make for buying the brand, so the USP. So once you've thought of sort of your benefits, the values and personality of the brand and the reasons to believe, it kind of then gives you, leads you to that, what's the USP that my brand can provide? So more specifically, you can also think, what's the one reason this customer, thinking back to the insight, would choose you? So for example, thinking back to our fashion brand, it might be, well, we offer the style advice from our experts, so you don't need to worry that you're not gonna get the right look or going back to the insight about them wanting to feel and look good. Um, well, our unique payment options mean you don't have to feel stressed about shopping because you can sort of spread the cost. Um, and then finally, um, that should lead you to your essence. So the distillation of the brand's genetic code into one clear thought. So your solution or your answer. So in terms of the essence, um, think back to all your sections and as you filling them out, hopefully hooks start coming to the forefront about your brand. So thinking back to our fashion brand and everything we've said about it, I might be thinking, well, it's your fashion friend because we're offering you the style advice. It's easy and we're an approachable brand. Or it might be something like it's fashion without limits because you can actually spend without having to worry about it or because it doesn't matter what size you are. Um, or it might be something like fashion fit for you and your life um, because we understand you as a customer and we can work around your busy life. A thing to remember is that you can have multiple essences. So if you're not happy with your essence, you can always try another insight. You can run your ideas past a team member on your creative team or your agency. An important thing to remember is that the essence isn't the final strap line. 
So if you haven't come up with something like every little helps, you don't need to worry. So I think <laughs> <laughs> the first time I was doing this, I was thinking, well, my essences aren't that catchy or they're just not strong enough. But that's not the purpose of this. This is just kind of to give you that initial angle. And then that helps you then kickstart the creative process or put it into your studio and start to get those discussions going. So this is a full summary of the brand key that we've seen. But as mentioned, we'll send you a slide and a blank template. So you've got each section and the definition. But I'll show you some examples of real brand keys that we've used um, for a campaign rebrand so you can see how it's brought to life. So then it just doesn't look like a form that you're filling in. <laughs> um, so uh, our first example is a B2C example that we did for an online fashion brand called Fashion World. Um, so Fashion World um, was really about providing lots of different solutions in lots of different sizes, things like um, boots and different widths or um, a big range of sizes or as lots of tailoring options for clothes. So really something for everyone. But what Fashion World was doing at the time is they had four brand pillars and they were using all of those messages to target their customers. So they found in research that the customers didn't really know what the brand stood for because we were throwing too many things at them. So they've asked us to really try and narrow that down. And I'll show you three brand keys that we used amongst others to try and get a sort of a new essence for the brand. So this is the first one. Um, and as you can see from what we mentioned about the audience, we've said things like, we know the average age is 51, the customers are C2D, size 18 plus, but we also know some other more um, insights, like a lot of these people were saying they're self-conscious or they need guidance um, in buying clothes. And in terms of competitors, there's lots of plus size competitors coming into the market and people have less to spend in difficult times. So the what, insight... what was interesting, Catherine, about this particular audience was they always put themselves last. So very family focused, almost sort of, you know, very often the the one person that everybody in the family went to with their problems. So they always ended up putting themselves last and family first, didn't they? Yeah, definitely. So I think a lot of them were kind of thinking, and these are things that they actually said, I wish someone could just tell me what works for me and make shopping fun again. So they almost kind of just didn't enjoy shopping anymore. So around the key, so the way that our brand plays a part, we said things like, well, it's an approachable brand, we're modern, you get the value for money, but it's fashion for real women with individual shapes because we have unique style solutions. We have lots of innovative fashion solutions that you don't see elsewhere. Um, and a real great range of sizes and great advice and tips. So as we were doing this, because they were saying, I wish someone could just tell me what works for me, we almost felt like, well, Fashion World almost answers all of that for you before you've even thought about it. So the essence that came out of this was Fashion World is your fashion psychic. And in the second brand key, um, the insight we looked at was shopping, it's just a hassle. I don't really know what suits me or where I can buy it easily. So what you'll see in these brand keys, um, obviously we repeat a lot of the elements because our target audience stays the same, our competitors stay the same. And a lot of the elements around the key about our brand stay the same, but you can start to pull out different things that relate to your insight. So for this one, one of the benefits was, well, you think shopping is a hassle, but actually we offer easy returns. It's really easy to order and it's easy to make payments because you can spread the cost. Um, so what came out for this one was shopping is a breeze. So all of those problems that you might think that are a hassle where there's lots of different reasons around this key, why it's actually a breeze to shop with us. And then in the final brand key, our insight was, I can never find what I want on the high street. The latest fashions are never going to suit my body shape anyway. So again, we repeated a lot of elements because they still made sense for this insight, but we pulled out things like the innovative fashion solutions, the USPs, we've got lots of unique style solutions for different reasons, like the shaping jeans or special coats that are tailored in different ways or the way that um, the back of a shirt is tailored. Um, but we also provide the value for money. So as we were thinking about this one, all of these answers are really smart solutions. Um, so what came out of this one is it's kind of clothing genius. 
um, because we have all of these smart solutions that you might not find elsewhere. So the essence that most resonated um, with the client and actually with the customers was this idea of clothing genius because it really tapped into Fashion World's unique fashion innovations and the fact that they've got solutions for all shapes and sizes. So this evolved from clothing genius into clever clothes. So you can see this was our final brand key and it still had all the elements from our original brand keys, but we kind of refined it into clever clothes. And then this is the complete rebrand. So this was the logo. So you can see Fashion World became the clever clothes shop. So taking all those elements from those brand keys really led us to having a really strong new branding that could then easily follow on to create a TV ad. We did press, we did catalogs, mailers, emails, etc., all linking back to why Fashion World is the clever clothes shop. So just to show you an example of the brand guidelines that followed on from that. So everything linked back to that chosen brand key. So the fact that we're clever because we're problem solving, there's inspiration, there's deals and value. Um, so this is the intro page from the brand guidelines, which was clever clothes at tempting prices. And it's a foolproof formula for looking fabulous. But we can still see that in there, our supporting messages were still brought in from the brand key. So things like flattery, fit, control, and the fact that we provide great value. Um, and this was really useful as well, because in every brief that we gave the studio following that, we said we need to ask ourselves in everything that we're saying, what, how are we being clever and how are we giving the customers a deal? So it always linked back to that message. So everything was cohesive. Um, then in this is a B2B example. Um, we work with Welcome Cottages um, to create a proposition aimed at the actual holiday cottage owners. So we wanted to show them why they should choose to advertise their holiday cottage through Welcome Cottages. So among other brand keys, I'll show you two routes that we explored. Um, and again, both of the insights were based on a lot of customer research and what we knew um, that the customers were thinking and saying. So in terms of the audience, we knew that most holiday cottage owners have one rental property um, and it's as an investment for additional income. Sometimes they stay there with their family or they let friends stay. We know they like to support local businesses and they'll hire additional services like cleaning. Um, we also know from the competitors that a lot of them are mirroring the benefits of welcome cottages or they're offering things like lower commission and there's an increase in local smaller competitors and specialists. So the insight on this one was, as a cottage owner, I want to make sure I'm with a company that cares about me as an owner and goes the extra mile to help me get bookings. So around the key, we could say lots of different things about um, how Welcome can answer that. For example, we give you property advice. Um, we spend extra on marketing to promote your cottage. You get an annual grading visit. Um, some of our values and personality are that um, we've got the personal touch. We treat you like a family. We're pet friendly. Um, reasons to believe are things like we have unique dynamic pricing. So it's really about um, a dedicated personal ex experience and we go the extra mile. So the essence that came out of this was we do more for cottage owners. So we know that we're doing more than a lot of competitors and we always go the extra mile. And then in the second brand key, the insight was, I've been with Welcome for over 10 years. It's simple and straightforward. I don't have time to be changing companies every year and I don't wanna get ripped off. So we knew with a lot of cottage owners, they, the thing that they want is to get the customers to the cottage and for everything to be simple. They don't want a lot of hassle. So once they're set up with a company like Welcome, they're happy with them and they trust them. And we found that with a lot of them, they were staying with Welcome for over 10 years because they didn't feel the need to be with anybody else. Um, and a lot of the things we pulled out, again, repeated from the first brand key, but things like we have a dedicated regional team and our staff really understands your needs. Um, so that one, what came out with that one, the essence was more owners stay with us. So when we brief that to the studio, I mean, there was other brand keys, but what came out of these two was a similarity, which you'll probably see. And that was the word more. Um, so we do more for you because we go the extra mile, we get you more bookings, we spend more on advertising, 
we get you more repeat bookings, so people coming back, more owners stay with us, you get more benefits, and you get more support from a dedicated regional team. So um, the final, these two essences led us to our strap line. So the B2B strap line became more to your door, um, which really encompassed the fact that you'll get more people to your door, but we also give you more as a company. And this eventually led to our consumer strap line. So for the people staying in the cottages, more from your holiday, because if you stay at a cottage, you get a lot more than you would with maybe other holidays. So just to show you an example of the rebrand for the owners, so you can see the strap line became more to your door. And this is a brochure cover for owners. And you can see things from the brand keys that start to come out. So things like come for the booking, stay for the service, maximize your income through decades of experience. So everything's kind of linking back to what we've learned in the brand keys. And this was the web page um, for the owner. So again, that element of more. So we do more for your holiday home. You get more bookings. We spend more time with you. And as I said, this quite neatly led into the B2B side of it. So welcome cottages, the strap line became more from your holiday. And it's because you get more adventuring, sightseeing. It's more enriching, unwinding, exploring, skipping, smiling, et cetera. Um, and then in our final example, uh, last year we looked at a B2B proposition for employee benefits brand Unum, which Adrian will take you through. Yeah, I thought we'd show, so we've shown you a consumer example from fashion e-commerce, fashion home shopping. We've shown you a holiday example, which actually crossed over between both um, consumer and or B2B and consumer unusually. This is sort of more uh, corporate and SME um, sort of uh, B2B uh, company, Unum, um, who, who offer uh, sort of employee benefits packages to medium and larger companies largely. Uh, and they particularly wanted to capitalize on the SME market, but they were experiencing, as you can see at the bottom, um, a, a lot more competition. So they had big established uh, competitors like Canada Life, but they're also experiencing a lot more competition from um, newer, more agile employee benefits providers like Vitality and Perkbox. So we were, again, we were lucky to have uh, an immense amount of research available to us from their existing um, customers. And like the previous examples that Catherine's shown you, we were able to sort of um, take from that research a number of um, insights. In fact, there were three that went into this presentation, but I've just uh, picked out one here. Um, they gave us the um, they gave us the values and personality of the brand, agile, trusted, collaborative, etc. The benefits that they offered were they had some tremendous. Uh, employee benefits, a workplace well-being hub, uh, this a help at hand app for employees who were covered by Unum's sort of contracts, uh, a LifeWorks help and support group. So a lot of really quite, um, they're in, in theory, they're, um, one of their key values was passionate, but we felt that actually a strong key value for them, a better key value for them was compassionate. Um, so in terms of appealing to em employers, you know, typically sort of HR directors and so on, who might say something like, my employees are the lifeblood of my business. I want them to feel valued. I want them to give us give. I want to give them as much support as I can. Then the brand key led us to a distillation, which was every employee matters. So this is sort of riffing on. Um, the original sort of Labour government, early 2000s, every child matters. Um, but I think Unum had a lot of um, evidence, a lot of reasons to believe that substantiated uh, a positioning around every employee matters. When we briefed that into the creative team, creative team came up with this proposition, people are precious. So you can see the inward facing every employee matters and the external, the customer facing distillation of that was people are precious. So that, that's really our final example from Catherine and I today. Um, so just to summarize what I think we've said, um, 
we recommend that you invest some time, you invest plenty of time in understanding and also challenging your current brand positioning. We recommend that you get clarity about what you stand for, not just what you sell or what services you offer. What do you stand for and find a differentiating element from your competitors? We recommend that having established that, you communicate that with consistency across every touch point that you can influence or control within your company um, and to do all that you can use the brand key as Catherine has shown you or any of the other models essentially to organize and clarify your thinking the solution to positioning or reposition your brand is with you it's in your head it's in the knowledge that you have and the knowledge that you can extract from from data and research and insight but actually what these models do, like the brand key, is help you to organise and clarify your thinking. So do that and use it to identify your strongest brand essence, the one that differentiates you from your competitors. Um, and, you know, as, as we've shown there, develop an internal and a customer facing proposition like Tesco's serving shoppers a little better every day internally becomes every little helps externally um, and that's really um, what we wanted to talk to you about today so we'll take any questions that you've got now I think we've got a couple haven't we Steve you have um, yes I've answered a couple um, just to confirm everybody um, I will be sending the slides and a link to the today's presentation in the next 24 hours or so uh, but Adrian's right, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, okay. I did see one from Jonathan at one point about what does C2D mean. Uh, it's probably a bit old school now, isn't it, Catherine? <laughs> but essentially the original um, the original sort of demographics that, that emerged with marketing in the 60s and 70s was based on the employment of the head of household. Uh, and based on the employment of the head of household, um, you would be... Um, essentially sort of assigned into a segment which was either which was a b sort of wealthy white collar professionals uh c1 um middle management supervisors and things like that uh c2 sort of um clerical positions maybe i've given some examples there are thousands de typically maybe unemployed or retired so it was occupation of the head of household so probably you know, given the wealth of data that's available to us now, there are a lot better ways of, of uh, it's a, a bit old school, Jonathan. Yeah. So, I think the key point there is you can say things like that, that are kind of generic, or you might say something like the age group is between these 20 years, but then further to that, it's really adding that extra element of the insights that you have, or kind of adding that human touch as well. Um, so it just gives you a really good picture of your target audience. Yeah. So an anonymous attendee has said, Catherine, what are some ways to advertise your brand that is sold via other retailers? So this is somebody who's who's a sort of a brand uh, manager selling through retailers. So it's frustr it can be frustrating, I think, when you don't control the end channel. But obviously, um, one of the things that you can do if you can clarify your thinking about what your target audience is, you know, really really established that it's you know for example in one of Catherine's um, examples uh, women who find shopping difficult on the high street and can't find clothes that fit once you've established what your target audience is then you make channel choices for example in terms of sort of display advertising um, and you can direct people to your sort of retail chat you know your retail outlets if you like um bev has asked catherine you, know, you go you have a go at this one are you finding brands are changing propositions or building on them in the light of the of covid and the current climate um yeah i think um they are um i think a lot of people are trying to really get across that safety element um or that trust element but i think some of them it's still the same proposition, but it's the angle behind it. So for example, Tesco, we know is every little helps. So during the pandemic, um, they did a lot of things of 
they sort of took that differently. So every little helps wasn't always about because we're cheaper or things like that. It was more about what we're doing within the shops to stay safe or um, we're providing hand gel as you go in, that kind of thing. So I think people are kind of, you're sticking to your roots and what your brand's about, but sort of tailoring it um, to what's happening. And I think it is always good to constantly question that. So how is my brand responding to what's happening in the market at the minute? I think you have to. I think we saw a lot of, um, we saw a lot of brands in lockdown one. Um, we're now in lockdown three, aren't we? Or we've been in lockdown forever, haven't we, Steve, in, in the north? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but um, a lot of brands early on, for example, people like Burberry switched over their manufacturing to uh, supplying PPE. Um, I know one of our clients, Studio, was supplying um, sort of PPE to local hospital lots of brands sort of stepped in to try and help out where the, the government wasn't able and that will do them long-term good you know in the eyes of their customers more recently a couple of interesting initiatives i'm pretty sure i've read about this week um curry's pc world are donating um a million pounds to fund um technology for teachers so there you go. That will resonate with both Catherine and Steve, who are attempting to hold homeschool and hold down a job at the moment. But yeah, so Curry's PC World have donated a million pounds in an alliance, I think, to supply technology to teachers and also training in how to get the most of sort of um, how to get the most out of technology in doing a online remote lessons remote learning and the other one is that marks and spencers have opened up their digital um archive digital learning archives that they have used for sort of apprentices in the past m and apprentices um but they've also you know they've opened them up to consumers so you are able to get access to lots of home learning homeschooling activities from courtesy of m and and again these are these are every little help steps, aren't they? It's, I don't want to solve global problems, but it is something that will resonate with an awful lot of people who are, you know, having difficulties um, sort of holding down a job and homeschooling. And, you know, it, it makes a difference that all, you know, it's the, remember, the brand is the sum of the perceptions uh, of, of, of the people who do shop with that brand and will shop with that or will buy from that brand. So yes, Bev, in answer, I think we've seen a lot of brands um, pivot or change their, you know, adjust their brand positioning to try and help out people that, that you know, in ways that will do them long-term, do the, the perception of their brand long-term good. EE is another good example. EE are currently um, giving free data to, to families um, that are having to go through the, the trauma of, of homeschooling. Um, so they're also doing something similar. <laughs> to um, that seems to be the, the last of the questions. Uh, thank you, Colum, um, Callum, for your, your, your complimentary comment on today's session. I personally really enjoyed today's session. Um, as I mentioned, I will be sending over the slides later on today, tomorrow morning, along with a link to, to the recording of today's session. Um, I would also just put a note in there with regards to our forthcoming sessions next week, uh, making money while you sleep with automated emails, followed by writing the perfect creative brief. And then finally, in this series of virtual midweek masterclasses will be Stuart Clark's session um, entitled Making Your Headlines Magnetic. Um, so thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any questions, please respond to to the email that I send you 24 hours or so. Um, but without further ado, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.